Welcome to the last panel of the conference, uh, which isn't the last event. Uh, followed after this panel, and we are still uh, going to have a roundtable discussion. Uh, not really summing up, but perhaps just opening more, more and more uh, perspectives. Um, and after that, uh, after a short break, uh, we will have our second keynote speech, keynote lecture by Irina Prokhorov. So, our last panel, uh, which is called Looking Back at Ta on Tan is Dad, First Hand Reflections, um, uh, we are extremely fortunate to have this opportunity to uh, listen to actual first hand accounts of what Tan is Dad was from the inside. Uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Robin Foyer Miller, whom I uh, was very coincidentally fortunate to uh, have met at a conference in Vancouver on Dostoevsky, which is not the first time is that author you can think of, but this is where we met. And uh, I was interested in the story that uh, Robert will be telling us, but I did not know uh, how much more there was to it. And um, since then, Robin and I have been working for almost two, a year and a half, um, on something that we do hope uh, sooner or later materializes um, as a book publication. Uh, Robin Foyer Miller is a professor of Russian and comparative literatures at Brandeis University, and she is the author of multiple works on Dostoevsky and the uh, Russian classics, among other things. Our second speaker will be um, Michael Scammell, uh, who will talk on the very important publication Index on Censorship, which he ran in the 70s, um, who was also instrumental in facilitating many, many important publications of Russian literature abroad. And uh, last but not least, uh, today on this panel, um, is Pavel Litvinov, who of course needs no introduction whatsoever, and all of us know that Pavel Litvinov was uh, among the few people who walked out onto the Red Square on August 25, 1968, protesting the uh, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, which happens to be one of those sad anniversaries we are celebrating um, one after another. Uh, 50 years ago. So without further ado, uh, Robin, thank you. So, um, and Yasha will warn me when I have five minutes left. Right? Okay, thank you. I would like to thank Polina Barshkova and especially Yasha Klotz for inviting me to speak today. In fact, Yasha's role has been unusually important, and at this point, my childhood diary of Moscow in 1963 seems in some ways to belong as much to him as it does to me. <laughs> Certainly, he has not read it with the same ambivalence that I do, or at least he has courteously not conveyed that to me. Moreover, in transcribing my diary side by side with my father's diary of the same period, he has undertaken a project that is fascinating in ways that have little to do with me or my father, but in the end have to do with recollection, record keeping, and memory. It's from that larger perspective that I will try to talk to you today and peel away some of the layers of the palimpsest that we all experience when we think about the past, about our individual past. The effort has certainly brought home to me the validity of Tolstoy's belief that it is impossible to write a true history, whether a history of yesterday or of Napoleon's invasion of Russia, or to completely understand any event, where it begins, where it ends, what it signifies. So, the top layer of the palimpsest, the present. Um, I had not known Yasha, uh, he, as he said, we met at a meeting, uh, and he asked if he could look at papers of my parents that I might have, or that were already in an archive at Brandeis University. He planned a two-day trip to Boston, 
uh, the first day to examine what he politely refers to as the Miller Home Archive, which is a pile of rubble in the basement, and the second day for the real archives at Brandeis University. So our little email exchange uh, for the top layer of the palimpsest, Saturday, February 18th, 2017. I'm just in the basement organizing a couple of things, clearing a space at the table for you to work. It's cold down there, even though the furnace is there, so be sure to bring a warm sweater. Thank you, Robin. Don't worry about the cold or the mess. I can actually help you organize things if you'd like me to. Please don't waste your time. Me. The mess is awful, and there are many boxes. Once we open some of them, I'll ask you to help me stack them in a closet down there. Some have to go to the library archives, and some I'll keep for a while more. It's all a terrible jumble, and this summer in the heat, I started to look at some stuff, and it was just painful. And then I write to my daughters, in about 15 minutes, this young professor, Yasha Klotz, is coming to look through numerous boxes in the basement and then spend the day at the archives of Grandma and Grandpa. It's all very strange. Some of those boxes I haven't even looked into because it's painful, more than kind of painful. So I'm trying to put on a thick protective coating for the next two days. Archives should be archives, so I'm letting it all go, but it feels incredibly strange. I think because my parents were scholars that they would approve, but maybe I'm wrong. I know that they each poured through letters in other people's archives at other times. And then after Yasha leaves, I write to him. I was just uh, hoping he got home safely. I was just rummaging in my briefcase to pull out papers I have to grade, and I found another letter from Struva, which had been in my office that I'd meant to give you. It's so short that I'll type it here. Or better yet, I'll photograph it. It's a letter he sent to the new leader about the sinyavsky danielle trial. I'll now go to the phone, photograph it, and send it to you. So that gives you a flavor of the present uh, part. However, the moment I remember most vividly uh, was when I went down to the cold basement with a cup of tea and some cookies for Yasha, uh, who had been sitting there for several hours wanting to smoke. There he was in his jacket amidst boxes of papers and the old toys of my now adult children. And to my horror, he was reading my little green diary. Uh, I, here it is. I hope you don't mind, he said. I found your diary in the box with some other papers. And this is the overflow diary. So he found these two things. Images of my ruminations about my boyfriend in Berkeley, my infatuation with uh, someone in Russia, my constant annoyance at my parents all flashed through my mind. After all, the important days of the diary were a mere few that didn't occur till the beginning of June. And I could see he was only through January and now reading February. But there was nothing to say the deed was done. Would he realize, though, how dishonest and pathetic the diary was, how artificial its tone, how skimpy its actual insights? None of that matters, said Yasha. It's interesting to see Moscow in 1963 through the eyes of an American schoolgirl. And in talking about this with Irina Paperna a couple of days ago at AC's meeting, she said, Robin, it doesn't matter what you say, you're an artifact. Um, <laughs> <laughs> much of my scholarly career has been devoted to writing about Dostoevsky. One of my very first articles was entitled The Morality of Confession Reconsidered. Even as a young person, I was intrigued by the underground man's allusion to Heine's comment that true autobiographies are almost impossible. Quote, that a man will certainly tell a lot of lies about himself. In his view, this is still the quote, Rousseau told a lot of lies about himself in his confessions and told them deliberately, out of vanity, dot, dot, dot. However, I am writing only for myself, unquote. I think that's where the real lies begin. Um, some years later, I found myself uh, writing at length about Dostoevsky's semi-fictional, semi-autobiographical work, The Peasant Marie, which Robert Louis Jackson described as a three-tiered memory, where, as one might expect, the different tiers or layers of the palimpsest are not in perfect harmony with each other. Thus can a diary kept over the course of four months, a little green book, while I was a teenager in Moscow, a later recollection in 1992, just after the death of my mother, and a still later memory now, both all collide with each other. 
Um, nevertheless, I somehow owe it to them, Catherine and Louis Foyer, the two adults at the center of the story I have to tell, to venture forth over half a century later, whereas in 1963 I was just a feckless kid who was not even that interested in what was going on under my proverbial nose. So the second layer of the palimpsest, roll back now to 1992, um, 26 years, I'll read a bit from a piece I wrote then, which appeared in a volume edited by Marietta Chudakova, which I have here if anyone wants to see it. Um, and it was translated into beautiful Russian by Irina Paperno. And I'll read you a little excerpt from that. So now the second layer, 1992. In June of 1963, my mother, Catherine Bellavo Foyer, found herself entangled in a series of events that were to change her life. And basically, I'll skip over here, but it was she who was given um, a copy of Anna Akhmatova's Requiem by Julian Grigorovich Oxman at Akhmatova's uh, request to smuggle out of Russia for publication in the West. And that's the Tommy's Dot connection. Pechorin lamented that he was not the main character in his life, that he appeared in the final act of the drama of others' lives. Novelists make standard use of deus ex machina, of ficelles, of characters whose role is a fifth business. Even David Copperfield wonders in his opening sentence if he will be the hero of his own life. He hoped that the subsequent pages, some 500 of them, would show, but the answer remains equivocal. Whatever suffering we endured, whatever crooked, clumsy scars remain, we were minor players, engines of circumstance and history. And I, a 15-year-old girl, a preoccupied, moody, boy-crazy teenager at the time, never even met Oxman. I only remember fragments, uh, such as my, what my mother told me on one of her visits to him when he, she had suggested that they go outside. He had angrily said, why bother? Let them listen. And yet at other times, he said that the authorities would hurt him by withholding medicine from his wife or even giving her harmful ones. My account is based solely on childhood memory, subject to vagary, error, distortion, and not on scholarship or knowledge of the period. So my mother died on 1st of March, 1992, and that's when I went on to write this um, essay. In February uh, of 1963, uh, my father, Louis Foyer, then a professor of philosophy and social science at the University of California, Berkeley, arrived in Moscow to give a series of lectures on Marx and Marxism as part of an academic exchange between the Soviet Union and the United States. I, then 15 years old, accompanied him. After his first lecture, which quoted parts of Marx's writings that contradicted Soviet dogma, all students were barred from the course, and only members of the Academy of Sciences were allowed to attend. And I did, too, until the 19th of February, when I enrolled in public school number 56 in Moscow. <clears throat> I shift to my 15-year-old voice. My journal for the 10th of February reads, I said something to Daddy like, what's tomorrow, another day at the Institute? And that has made him insist even more that I should go home. Then 11th February, went to the Institute again today, more arguments. 12th February reads, another day at the Academy. But the real focus of that entry is on some forgotten Yuri, who I thought attractive who I think later denounced my father in a Soviet newspaper. Another excerpt for 22nd February, written after three days at school number 56. I must tell you the way the boys here flirt. They throw paper wads at me, draw funny pictures of me, and on the way home, some Polish boys in my class threw snowballs at me. We had Jim and Liana, she was my friend, and I fooled around with the volleyball. Later, I offered them gum. Liana said she'd bring me some Russian sweets tomorrow. I was looking up the Russian word for joke in my dictionary. They were looking over my shoulder and saw the word Jew. They started to giggle and asked me to pronounce the word for that in English. I asked why they were laughing, and they said the teacher was a Jew. Then I asked Liana if they didn't like Jews. She said no, they liked them very much, but some people didn't. I told her I was a Jew. She was surprised. Later, she asked me to go to her house sometime soon. The next day, 23rd February, reads, Today, Liana gave me a sort of doll. It is very sweet. In class, one of the Polish boys, Spichek, 
said that Russia had oppressed Poland. The class went into an uproar. Kids were mad. The teacher wouldn't call on him. Then on the 6th of March, the Russian teacher was saying all sorts of things about capitalism in Europe. Their book is filled with pictures of factory boys being whipped. I began to hate her. I wanted to scream, thought up speeches in my mind as I wanted to rush out of the room, but they would have been wasted. Lena insisted that Moscow is bigger than New York. <laughs> Fast forward to our departure in June. Um, my mother and I planned to leave the Soviet Union via train from Moscow to Leningrad to Helsinki. My father was to leave a few days later by plane. Um, and our troubles began in earnest then on the, 5th of, on the 3rd of June. Uh, a suitcase, a big suitcase that we had in the back of a, a car of someone from an em the Israeli embassy. The lock was delicately picked and the, the suitcase was stolen. Uh, and the police had absolutely no interest in uh, helping us with this. No interest at all. The, the suitcase only uh, contained winter clothes that we were going to give away, but they were looking for other things. And at that point, my parents became very nervous. My mother and I uh, went to the train station to board the night train to Leningrad on the evening of the 5th of June. She had booked a private compartment. We opened the door to find two men inside. One was small, dark, oily, and spoke impeccable English. The other was some kind of army officer, very fat, a uniform covered in decorations, with a huge, rippling, bulbous, shiny, bald head. Two typical bad guys, I realize now, right out of a great B movie. My mother quickly began to protest, all to no avail, that there must be some mistake. They were overtly hostile to us and not even willing to leave the compartment so that we could undress for bed. Finally, pajama clad or not, I do not know. We were all in bed, my mother on a lower berth, I above her, the oily man below, the fat officer above. The space between the two bunks was narrow. One had to stand sideways and it was dark. I lay with my back pressed against the cold wall and closed my eyes. Suddenly I opened them and there in the dark, staring at me the way I imagine a snake fixes its prey, was the fat army officer. His eyes literally gleamed in the darkness. In a single, deliberate, rough gesture, he swung his heavy bare arm across into my bed. I watched from some other zone of experience, silent, horrified, and amazed. His hand groped for my body, found my chest, and as I already was pressed to the wall, tried to lurch away, he began, as the New York Times obituary of my mother reported it so delicately, to rough me up. Finally, I regained the workaday consciousness I had lost and cried out to my mother for help. The lights went on, a kind of four-way hysterical scuffle ensued. I became aware that my mother, weeping and shouting, was trying to defend me, but she was also somewhat ridiculously, it seemed to me at the time, clutching her purse, which the oily man was trying unsuccessfully to grab. The rest of the night is a complete blank. Uh, I cannot remember how the incident ended, whether we all turned off the lights again and went back to sleep, or whether I stayed down with my mother in the berth while she glared, glared angrily at the two men in my diary for those nights as a complete blank, too, despite all the overflow. The next morning we arrived in Leningrad, where we spent most of the day in custody in the police station. Our troubles uh, continued, and then finally on the 7th, we boarded the train for Moscow. Shortly before we reached the border of Finland, four men appeared and took my mother into the next compartment. I could hear the tones of her voice through the thin wall, arguing and pleading. The train stopped. I looked out into the corridor, and it suddenly seemed as though most of the car had been taken over by the KGB. There was a purposeful bustle going on, men closing doors, walking to and fro. The minutes passed. Finally, my mother came back, surrounded by the four men, one of whom had a gun pointed at us. She said, Robin, get your things. We're getting off the train. Here, mother? We climbed down off the car, clambered over the stony railroad bed, and stood at gunpoint in a scrubby sort of field. The men took my address book. They surrounded us and told my mother that if she wouldn't sign the papers they wanted her to, a statement, I think, that she had had numerous visits with Oxman, that she and I would be arrested and would rot in a Soviet jail. We just stood there. The man with the gun seemed both foolish and frightening. His gun seemed awkward, a naked, clumsy embarrassment. People from the drain, train were hanging out the window, staring at us, eating food, littering. Nearly an hour went by. The sun was hot. 
We continued to stay surrounded by the men. Finally, one of them went into a nearby little hut. I thought it was an outhouse. It wasn't. He must have made a phone call. He emerged, waved his arm angrily to the side as if brushing away flies, and told us to get back on the train. Our ordeal had officially ended, but for my mother, it had tragically just begun. In the next hours and days, I watched as my mother began to chain smoke, an activity I had read about but never witnessed. But her hands were shaking so violently that she could not always get the cigarette to her mouth. On the night of the 7th of June, safe in Helsinki, a naive and dramatic teenager, me, wrote, all her life she's going to feel that as though whatever happens to him will be her fault. Naive and dramatic I may have been, but unhappily these words proved true. Uh, my father's essay, which appeared in the same volume, and our agreement was we wouldn't look at each other's until they were finished, because they're so different, um, could not be more different from mine. My piece, as you have just heard, is untitled, ruminates on the haziness of memory, the change that overcame my mother, uh, and the events of the two train trips. His, from the outset, is a cultural historical essay. Note his title. Cultural Exchange in the Soviet Union in 1963 and How the KGB Tried to Terrorize American Scholars and Suppress Truth. <laughs> uh, his essay bristles with interesting historical nuggets. Struva as a young Russian <coughs> officer in World War I, also Struva as a baby being dandled by Lenin's wife Krupskaya, um, his, friendship, his friendships with Oxman and Akhmadova, um, then a long description of Oxen and anecdotes about Bukharin. His is a narrative fueled by anger, whereas mine is personal and expressive of fear and uncertainty. Third layer of the palimpsest. How am I doing on time? Um, Moscow, 1963. So at last we come to the days themselves. The days in Moscow where I was busily writing in my diary and my father and his unbeknownst to each other. My mother did not keep a diary, but there is also the correspondence between her and Gleb Petrovich Struva during this period, quite voluminous, between January 21st, 1963 and December 6th, all transcribed by Yasha. Yasha's transcribed all of this. I can't bear to look at the diaries. I only look at what he's transcribed and has politely cut out, so I don't even what astonishes and troubles me in reading my own diary entries for these awful days surrounding our departure is how I did not describe what actually happened, but toned it down. I reported the officer later, not that night, the officer's groping of me and his disgusting physical presence. But I left out the four-way scuffle in the train when I turned on the light the scratches on my chest, and later the man with the gun in the field, and other details that I remember vividly. I think that, as my daughter suggests, I was trying to correct or modify or submerge the awfulness of what occurred to make it go away, to compensate for it in some way. That's why I think diaries can lie. And this was something I often did in my diaries, which I kept for many years. On June 8th, the day after all this, I write oddly, I have been seeing the world and I have not been telling about it. Um, I'd like to spend the rest of my time. Is there time? Five minutes. Okay. Reading some less fraught entries from my Moscow diary. Um, these are the simpler entries. Um, it's possible that someone's been reading my diary. Also possible that our room is wired. An American student, Pomper, came to talk to Daddy tonight. We had to walk out of the room just in case. Think of the average Russian to the average American. The American has so much more, little luxuries, and most of all, freedom. He doesn't need to be scared. He can better himself for himself instead of working like an ant or a bee for some common project. I think this sort of thing is good too, but one must first establish his own dignity, his own place on earth. Pomper told us that people exist on barely enough for existence. That's why you're cheated on change. And he said that even though they're so poor, at the end of the week when the worker brings home his pay and gives most to the wife, matriarch society, he goes out and gets drunk, drunk, stone drunk. This in itself is proof there's something very lacking in his system. Pomper is a Jew, but he doesn't look like it at all. He's very blonde, as I recall. Thus, he has been able to find out much on anti-Semitism here. People come to him, grumble that Jews are always on the top 
One even believes, and these are intelligent university students, that Jews are born with something in their throats that keeps them from saying the Russian R correctly. We phoned the synagogue to find out when the service began. It's undoubtedly under surveillance, and the man was very frightened. And when Daddy asked, started to tell him who he was, the man just said, no, no, just tell me what you want. Uh, we went to the Lenin Library with Olga. Only university graduates are supposed to go, but they let me in. It's a huge and very good library. Afterwards, we, she left, and we went to the Pushkin Museum. The art there is very interesting, of people working in the fields and of the communist leaders themselves. It probably inspires the people even further to work. There's a quotation by Lenin down in the lobby. The greatest force we have is the power of the peasants. While there, we met a young physics student and his cousin. Daddy got into a big talk with them. We went for tea. We had rolls filled with meat, very greasy, talk politics. I think they could tell Daddy was right, but they didn't like it. The boy asked me out. I didn't like him, though. There was something about his looks and his breath. Uh, we took our first subway. Um, then we walked back to the hotel at night. The streets we walked through were like those of a little village, narrow, houses all close together with vacant lots filled with snow. There are these unbelievably ramshackle huts, very small, about the size of our newspaper room, made out of thin wood, and people live here. That's what's so awful. And the houses are all nestled right in the shadow of the Hotel Ukraine. I went to a cafe with Liana. Time's up. Oh, and had a huge <clears throat> dish of ice cream. Very good, creamy. And believe it or not, huge glasses of champagne. Children our age drink it here. I think we all got drunk. I don't like the feel of it in my throat, but once it's in my stomach, I really love it. The bubbles are fascinating. They asked me to tell them about American boys. They don't like Russian boys at all. Leanna says they make her sick. On the way home, we stopped in many stores, uh, and they come back to the hotel with me. Then I go to her house for dinner. We get into a political argument. I wish I knew more to be, knew more history. Um, she said that uh, their paper tells them how Americans want war. I said we didn't. She said, oh, yes, we did. As much as I like Vienna's smugness and wrong smugness at that seems to be the virtue, question mark, I hate most in Russians. I said our people were like theirs, that we did not want war, and that we thought they did. She looked disturbed, and she said, they didn't, but we did. Finally, she said, she said well, maybe 80 or so Americans want war. Vienna <laughs> <laughs> said, um, OK, I'll skip that part about the slums. We also spoke about why the Polish boys aren't liked. Jacek is not liked because he said he wanted to be rich and go to America and be a famous piano player. She feels that is too capitalistic. Frankly, I'm all for it. And Spieschik, they don't like because he's a fool. She said that Russians like Poland and Poles, but they don't like, they don't like Russia. I said that that was because Russia had oppressed Poland. She said that was back in the time of the Tsar, and that later Russia had liberated them from the Germans. Then mom explained to me about the pact and the partition in World War II, but Russians are not taught any of this. All these lies, these deceptions, I want to scream or cry. Then we got onto the subject. It's probably time to stop. We'll stop. Um, there's a lot, well, there's 206 pages. So anyway, thank you to Yasha for transferring.